here we go. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our last webinar for our spring 2019 uh, with uh, Jason uh, Schrantz, uh, who participated in the Summer Institute, is going to talk about uh, digital media uh, and media production in rural community. Um, Jason, take it away. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, so with this project, what I wanted to talk about is, is you know, as you can see, uh, using digital media to explore culture. And really this has uh, uh, kind of a deeper significance um, for me. I'm a writing teacher, I teach in English. Um, and the, the goal of the project is to explore how integrating several digital media tools um, really pushed me to start rethinking the writing process. Um, and specifically, it helped me to see the writing process as a form of media production. Um, because, because it is, right? I mean, we, we use tools uh, to take those ideas that are inside of our head and, and to give them some kind of material shape. And, and with that materiality, we can, we can distribute them and share them and challenge them and refine them. Uh, and and whether, even if those tools are just a pen and a piece of paper or, or a word processor and a, and a printer, uh, we're always engaging in some form of media production when we're writing. Um, but I think so often writing is thought of as something separate than the production of media. It's thought of as this, this kind of um, very isolated and serious work. Uh, we don't give a lot of thought to the tools that, that we're using. Um, and, and I guess I found that, that when we started to focus on the tools, we, I think that we um, are able to practice some stronger and better uh, writing habits. Uh, really all sound um, pedagogical theory about writing uh, talks about the importance of being able to share and collaborate and refine uh, uh, these ideas in kind of a collective community. Um, so uh, what I wanted to try to do is um, use some different tools to, to kind of focus on these features of sharing um, and, and ultimately develop a curriculum that, that really pushes students to uh, not just write a research paper, not just you know expand on a topic that I give them, but teaches them to explore kind of their own ideas, to test their ideas, to share ideas, um, to edit and distribute and revise ideas, and, and to be able to challenge each other. Um, and in doing so, to ultimately hone some real-world uh, transferable skills um, to produce something that has meaning for them um, and can spark conversation and maybe even provoke change. So, Jason, before we, we delve into um, the project that you did, if you can um, give some background so we know, you know who is talking about you, and then we'll ask the other participant also a little bit to introduce themselves and then you'll share the, the project, but give us some context that we can understand and then we'll share each one who we are. Okay, yeah, I was, I was, uh, so I um, grew up in Michigan and I, I, but I lived out on the East Coast in Rhode Island for about six years, uh, teaching and, and doing my PhD at the University of Rhode Island. And, was two years ago when I graduated, I was hired to teach at a community college up in um, northern Michigan. And I'll, I'll talk about that because that setting is really important to this project. So I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and so, uh, but I am a, a, a writing and a literature instructor. And, um, you know, what, I'm sorry, what, what, uh, what else did you want to, anything else you wanted to know? No, that, that's, you know, yeah, giving that, that background. Um, so we'll just have each one of the participants, like, introduce themselves, and then we'll get back to you because I forgot, like, in the beginning. So, um, Antonio, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I am Antonio. I am a teacher from Colombia. And I, uh, I uh, now I am studying about the media literacy, and I am so happy in this space for sharing many ideas and about the media literacy, and I, I will continue in participate in that in this space. It is for me very important to listen in and share ideas. So, so interesting for me. Thank you. Antonio, it's great to see you again. Your interest and in expertise in media literacy is uh, becoming an important part of our media 
Education Lab community. So it's nice to see you again. I'm Renee Hobbs, uh, a teacher, researcher, author, and um, of course, I co-direct the Summer Institute in Digital Literacy. Catherine, you're next. Ah. Uh, Catherine is writing. She doesn't have um, access to microphone. My name is Kate, and I work in public libraries with teens and college students with technology and digital literacy. I also just finished my MLA, MLIS, and I'm pursuing in career in community college libraries. Wonderful. Great. Thank you. And I'm um, Yonti. I'm uh, the associate director of the Media Education Lab. I teach at Columbia College Chicago. Um, and interested in uh, media production and rural community in my current uh, work in New Mexico. So, very excited to hear about now the actual project. So, Jason. All right, so I, I, do you need me to, to kind of go back and say what I was saying before, or can I just take off? No, 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 just take it, take it away right. from there. Like, we, we have the, the whole concept now, the yeah. actual project. Okay, great. Yeah. So, um, so one thing when I, uh, this is really a big transition moving from a place like, uh, uh the university of Rhode Island, or I was at a um, Northern Michigan university before that to moving to this really small rural community college. And so I think it's important to define, uh, what is rural. So I don't know if you guys, can you guys see this map I have up here? Uh, all right. So, um, so, uh, go give it community college is in Ironwood, Michigan. And it's the part of Michigan, if you ever talk to somebody from Michigan, they like to use their hand to point out where they're at. Uh, and we're so far from that, we're not even uh, identifiable, locatable by the hand. If you could see that green dot up there, that's where Ironwood, Michigan is, the farthest uh, western spot of the Upper Peninsula. Um, and I had an interesting experience when I came over here from, um, when, I, when I first moved out here for the job, uh, when I drove here with my family from Rhode Island, as soon as I got here, I was asked to go to Detroit for a conference. And the distance, it, it takes longer to get to Detroit, Michigan from Ironwood, Michigan than it did from North Kingstown, Rhode Island to Detroit, Michigan. Um, and so that's kind of, we have to cross that bridge. That's uh, a, quite, a, quite a trek. But really the real definition, I think, of how to, how to define what a rural space is, and there's a lot of scientific studies to back this up, is that uh, it, it's the distance between where you're located and the nearest Target or Starbucks, um, at least according to my wife. Uh, and so the nearest Target and Starbucks is in Duluth, Minnesota. And in order to get a Starbucks for us, uh, we have to drive all the way across Wisconsin and into Minnesota. Um, and so this is kind of my way of, of just kind of explaining how, how small and unpopulated this area is. Pull together just a few facts, and this will kind of factor in later uh, to, to kind of explain how this um, project started to take shape. Uh, Gogibbet County has about 15,000 people, and that uh, equals to about 10,000 or 10 people per square mile, even though um, you can drive for miles and not see anybody. It's most of your population is in three main cities um, that are kind of next, right next to each other. Uh, in terms of demographic, it's uh, we have 92% uh, white population with a median household income of less, it's actually less than $35,000. Um, and that's not per person, that's per household. Um, it's mainly a mining and timber community and um, which you can imagine is not uh, really thriving these days. Um, and, and the population has kind of been a steady decline since the, the early 1940s. And this is when a lot of the lumber mills, the paper mills started to shut down and when the mine started to close. And we went from a population of around 34,000 to, to like 15,000 now. Um, and yet in 1932, uh, when the population was up, uh, Go Give It Community College was uh, started. Uh, currently we have an enrollment of less than 1,000 students and our main, um, our main programs are uh, we have a ski area management program. We actually have a ski hill right on campus, um, which is great in the winter. We get season passes for it. Uh, and we have really, really long winters up here. Um, and then we also, some of the other programs, forestry and building and welding trades. Uh, there's not an English department 
there's kind of a general education um, core uh, uh, degree that houses some of the English classes. Um, other than that, you know, we have nursing and uh, criminal justice are some of the big programs here. Um, so this poses uh, a series of challenges, I think, in the classroom. Sorry, let me jump over here. Some of the um, some of the challenges in the because it is very based on um, uh, on trade programs. There is kind of a um, ambivalent attitude towards some of the humanities, your sociology and psychology, your history, um, and, and and really towards any kind of writing and English program. Um, one of the biggest differences I noticed coming here um, was had to do with with um, the challenge of, of kind of sparking intellectual curiosity. And I was, I was really spoiled to be able to teach at, at the University of Rhode Island and, and uh, you know, a couple other universities where, um, you know, this isn't all, all, all across the board, but there's, just, there's, there's these institutions in place at a, at a larger college campus that promote um, this, this kind of intellectual curiosity, ranging from the, the booths you see at the student center that bring your awareness to social issues all the way to um, you know your the research of your professors and the the specific focus of classroom. There's a lot of uh, this kind of uh, uh, intellectual activity, and, and students come to class often kind of curious about certain things. Have these places they want to go. Um, but what I found here uh, is that because we're so trade driven, um, which is which is uh, you know a really great thing. I mean it's 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 good for a lot of reasons, uh, but it it also kind of takes that, that area of interest away from some of the humanities programs. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I don't think it gives students a really great opportunity to, to kind of spark and hone that intellectual curiosity. Some of the other challenges that we have are, um, because we're a small institution, we have really limited resources in, in low tech classrooms. Um, we have a couple computer labs, uh, but your average student at Go Give It Community College doesn't have a laptop. Um, doesn't have access to a computer at home. Um, and so you often see these two computer labs uh, really full during the days uh, where students are trying to get projects in um, because once they leave campus, they won't have access to that. So in the writing classroom, I, the, the two main uh, problems I had, or the two main, I guess, uh, challenges I wanted to address was, um, or is, uh, Sparking this intellectual curiosity, promoting, uh, uh, encouraging students to do some some kind of meaningful um, um, work and and explore what the, the things that they're curious curious about, and also give them room to um, produce media content, digital content, because uh, you know despite the fact that that we don't have a lot of the resources at the college, uh, all the students in my classroom still have smartphones and they still have. Uh, different ways that they can access some of this technology and I, and I, and I thought that maybe if we could uh, uh, find ways to to channel the way that they are already producing media content and communicating online um, then I could use that uh, in, in my own classroom um, so that was uh, some of my solutions and uh, one, of the, one of the my main thing is I wanted to focus on culture and this came from uh, I, I'm being new to the area it is a very unique culture, something I'm not uh, necessarily used to. And uh, I thought it'd, it'd be really great to let my students um, basically become ambassadors to the, to the culture of the area, um, to teach me about the area and, and the values and the beliefs and the history, um, the way people communicate and live and, uh, and kind of share their life together. And, and this is a, a topic that kind of has something for everybody. Um, even though even like one community like this can host myriad cultures, uh, they're, they're all kind of unique in their own ways and students can find different ways to access this topic. Um, and so using our smartphones, collaborating with each other, using the computer labs when we can, we set out to explore culture. Um, the goals of this project, um, were to find some personal interest in your research. I think you do better work if you care about that work. You know, you know, it probably goes without saying. Uh, to collaborate, to really emphasize this part of the writing process that so often is relegated to, to maybe a one-day writing workshop. You know, instead, make the entire writing process a collaborative uh, uh, event. 
with multiple layers and multiple access points for collaboration with different groups. Um, and then also to challenge traditional modes of composition. Uh, this is something that I tell my students all the time, that in the real world, you will encounter very few situations when a seven page research essay is the appropriate response. Um, more often, we respond through uh, we respond through you know through letters, through videos, through um, sometimes through flyers, through face to face conversations. And so, I want to um, think about composition in terms of real world modes of communication. And then finally, to produce good and meaningful work, um, create something that you can be proud of, and that you, and, and in doing so, you can allow you to develop some useful uh, skills. All right, so I broke the project. We, we, had, we, we set out then the, uh, as, as kind of a theme for the semester is we're going to take the semester and just explore culture. And that's, that's the really uh, explore Uper culture. That's what they, they call somebody from the Upper Peninsula or the UP of Michigan, call them a Uper. And so we're going to explore Uper culture. And we had to start at, uh, at really a very um, introductory level. And so what we did was um, we used, uh, one of the first things I did was I used Flipgrid and just had students um, read a couple things and then turn, turn their phones on themselves and just define, take a minute to define what is culture. Um, and so we did these Flipgrid videos. Uh, And this is my, my Flipgrid from my students. And when I, when I show this, this kind of, I mean, you guys, I'm sure you guys are familiar with Flipgrid. Uh, I learned about it at the digital, the Summer Institute in Digital Literacy and, and started using it right away that, that summer in an online class I was teaching. And, and I really love it because it gets the students away from the writing forums and it lets them kind of communicate without all those uh, sort of reservations and insecurities that, that come up when you're, when you're writing, that slow process of writing. Instead, they can just say what's on their mind. But when I use a technology like this, uh, and when I share this like in professional development with my faculty, I get a lot of concern, like faculty will ask me, um, how, do you, how do you teach students how to do something like this? And so uh, uh, the, 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 the real answer to that is I try to demonstrate it in class and oftentimes it's kind of messy and sloppy. And, and I think that it, it shows students um, that this work can be, um, it, will, it will take a little bit of trial and error, but that, that process of figuring something out is really uh, helpful in learning these tools. And so I have, a, 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 I didn't intend to do this, but I have a, um, in this class, I had a, a smart Alex student who thought it'd be really funny to videotape me with a smartphone talking about Flipgrid and then to post it as his response. And, and, and I thought it actually showed kind of a good example of how um, sometimes when we're introducing these different digital media tools, we can mess up and make mistakes and, and it's all right. It kind of demonstrates that sort of human element to these tools. Um, so here's a video of me trying to teach this. Whatever you want to, and then you would stop recording. I never going to do that. Counts down, and there. So as you can see, I'm having these uh, these problems with the the filter on Flipgrid. It's doing this kind of like horror film sort of black and white flashing in the background. Uh, and, and it ended up making um, a project that probably would have been a little bit intimidating for students to, hey, try this new technology, post it by Monday. It, it, it took some of the pressure off because they could see, you know, me engaging with it and then solving uh, some problems in real time. Uh, there it is. Look at it. I don't know why it's so creepy, but to me, culture is, culture uh, can be differentiated between universal human nature and unique individual personality. So I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that, blah, 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 human nature, we all crave certain things, we crave food, we crave companionship, but also there's unique individual personality habits that I've developed, and that's how I would define my culture. Okay, so I'm uh, demonstrating Damn, this. Damn, Jason, that is awesome. Just <laughs> have to say, inadvertently, <laughs> Thank you. inadvertently, you created something really freaky interesting <laughs> and, and yes you demonstrated your problem-solving trial and error but 
actually, it's a very cool look. Bravo, buddy. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it wasn't what I was going for, but I mean, it, 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 I really believe that like to do a lot of these projects, you know, I'm not a web designer and I don't produce podcasts, but I know how to require students to do them. And I know how to, I know the tools to um, figure them out if, if I need to. Uh, and, and if I were to, you know, spend, I could spend weeks in class going through the ins and outs of design theory and graphic design and uh, desktop publishing and all these different things. But really the, the, the work comes when students struggle with this. Uh, and that's what I found with a lot of these. I demonstrate a lot of this in class and you can see I have some kind of cool, um, we had some really cool Culture responses. Culture is defined as a group of people that share common interests, values, or beliefs. Although that they may share some, not all of them are identical, such as like a sports team. Yes, they all enjoy playing the same sport, but outside of the sport, they all have their own interests and their own different beliefs. So not every single culture is the same, and they don't all share the same interests. I just want to show one more because I want to – highlight on something that students were honing in on very this is I'm pretty sure this is the kid that videotaped me uh. what is culture to me culture is the ideals principles traditions and the general way of life of individuals within a society people express their culture in many different ways this could include visual indicators such as tattoos or choice of apparel or mental indicators, such as the observance of certain holidays. For example, I consider myself part of the gaming culture. So wearing tees based on my favorite games is a normal practice for me. So I'm not sure why exactly he used a, voice, uh, a voiceover thing, um, but, but some of the things I think that's interesting about that, uh, what he did and what the, the woman before him did, was they really focus on how unique uh, the unique ways culture can be defined as, for example, part of a sporting community or a gaming community. Um, and a lot of the students found their niche this way, just through saying, like, I'm a part of this culture. This is my group. And this is what my project is going to be about our sports teams and the, the values and beliefs that we share. And then, um, and then so right after defining it, I asked students, because we, we kind of did some digital media and then we did some, some writing. We'd go back and forth. And I asked students to write a personal narrative about their culture, about a, a specific moment in their life in which they um, uh, started to develop a certain belief or, or, or uh, that, that kind of um, reified their, their values and something. And, and so they would go from, this is what culture means, and then this is where I see culture in my own life. And I have the link to um, this assignment, and it's, I'll post it in the comment section. I won't go over it right now, but I'll just, you know, it's, it's there if you ever want to use it. And some of the skills that this stage um, really honed were it allowed the students to, to do research, to synthesize the way that culture was defined in a lot of different pieces of writing, and then to, to come up with their own definitions, allow them to reflect on their own culture, and then just begin that exp exploration process of, of seeing culture as something other than kind of an academic study, but seeing it as a, as a sort of personal reflection and a personal study. So uh, that was kind of what I would call phase one. And phase two, this is where we really tried to hone in on the uh, collaborative effects. Uh, again, I have no experience with, with doing podcasts, except that I've heard that some instructors were doing it. And I thought, well, I mean, if they're doing it, why, why shouldn't I do it also? I really was drawn to, uh, I listen to a lot of podcasts, and I'm really uh, drawn to all the different um, composition modes that take place in a podcast. I mean, there's storytelling, there's research, there's uh, opinion and editorial uh, aspects, there's um, exposition, there's all these different strategies to explore an idea. And then the organization of those things. And this, this, what I tell my students so often is, you know, writing is all about how you organize your ideas. And, and a podcast is a great way to take the sort of intimidating process of putting pen to page out of the equation and start organizing clips of audio. And uh, uh, again, I had the assignment for this up here. I'll let you kind of explore that on your own. Um, but one thing we did to start out was a two-part project where the very first thing the students had to do is they had to go out into the, the, the web uh, and, and find an example of a, call, of a podcast that explored place, that sort of a specific place and describe the culture of that place. We did this really cool thing 
where I was teaching three sections of 101 at the time, and I had I shared a Google document with all three sections, and they once they found their podcast, um, they had to add it with a brief description to the Google Doc. So where you have three classes, 20 students each, all of a sudden you have about 60 to 70 students contributing to this exhaustive list of podcasts about place. And they came up with some really great ones. Um, gave a really, really kind of basic demonstration of how to share a link uh, using Google, uh, Google Docs. And then you can, I gave a couple examples of ones that I did. And then you can see as I scroll down here, these are all um, student contributions to this list. There's something like 12 pages of podcasts that have to do with a specific place. And then students had to write a short report about this podcast and it allowed them to, and in that report, they had to kind of analyze the strategies um, that they were using, um, the podcast were using. And this was sort of a way to prepare them for creating their own podcast, which was, of course, the next step. Uh, so after this, the students um, created their own podcast and we had so much fun. Uh, I don't know if the students would consider it <laughs> as fun as I did, but we had a lot of fun, again, like with Flipgrid, um, demonstrating this in class. I just cut out um, two class days to go over how to create a podcast. I kind of messed around with GarageBand and Audacity with two of the programs. And what we did was we, we came up in class, we, we spent one whole class defining the, um, developing like the brainstorming stage. So we said, what is our, what is our podcast gonna be about? And one of the classes we came up with, let's do a podcast about um, tips for incoming students. So, so pretty, pretty appropriate for, for this kind of project. And then we said, so what do, what do incoming students need to know? And we, we created a list on the whiteboard. Well, uh, what, kind, what classes are going to be like? Um, where, to, where to get help with financial aid? Um, where to find food? Uh, you know, those kind of things. So we put this all on the board, and then students broke into groups, and they were all responsible for doing a short, like, one and a half, 90-second uh, um, segment on this topic. And with the idea that the next day they could go out over that day for homework, kind of gather the audio clips or the material they would need to record that segment. And then when they came into class the next day, we would actually demonstrate how to record the podcast, how to edit, how to you know, make mistakes, how to fix those mistakes. And so for that next day, I brought in, I brought in my guitar and my banjo so we could come up with some cool like music, intro music. And then we put um, the audacity uh, on, on the projector so everybody could see it. And students would come up and they record their segment. Some of them would have interviews that they took on their phone and they'd hold it up to the mic. And they just kind of this really, really beautiful like, patchwork of all these different ideas. And in the end, you know, it was, it, it was, it was really solid. I mean, it, of course, it wasn't a polish. We could have done more work on it, but it gave students a really good idea of how to piece these things together. And they were part of the entire process, the organization, the brainstorm, the developing, and they could see all the different layers in that. Can so, you, sorry, can go ahead. Specify. So I'm, I have some kind of a vision in my head of how your class would look like with you with the instruments and the, the students with the phone and everything. But I'm trying to think, you're saying you have 20 students in your class and you're doing a collaborative podcast. So can you a little bit more elaborate? Because I see mayhem and usually in my classes, that's how it works. And eventually it is a collaborative, but kind of for, for people to envision better, how does it actually look like? So I can envision the final product that is not exactly polished and I yeah. can understand the assignment that you're giving, but to get from one place to another, like what was going, you don't need to like, you know, an hour going over it, but, Give us a little bit more detail how it looked like so we can really envision this process. What was going on in your class? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, I guess first is uh, uh, mayhem is a great way to describe it. We really uh, embraced the, the chaos um, in my classrooms. Um, but uh, so, so what we did was we, we all kind of brainstormed as a, like a 20 person group and students were kind of shouting out, this needs to be included, this needs to be included. This, so, so as they're shouting out, I'm just standing in front of the board uh, with a marker and I'm just, just the recorder. I'm just rec writing things down at this point. I'm trying not to give them my own feedback or my input. I'm just letting them develop the ideas. And then, uh, and then I say, you know, we'll look at it. We'll say, okay, we want to do a five minute podcast. We have 12 things on the board. Let's narrow it down. And then again, it's back to the students. 
cut out this, you know, and, and so they'll kind of, uh, you know, lead me in that process. So really at this point, I'm just an instrument for recording and cutting out what they say. Now, I think what you're uh, talking about though is when it gets to the actual recording and you have these 20 students here and five of them are recording and other ones are talking, that's where it gets a little bit uh, uh, dicey. So what we would do here is we would, um, I would invite uh, five students to come into the front, up to the front of the class, and I would tell the rest of the students uh, that they, of course, they either need to be really quiet if they want to watch um, what we're doing, they can sit in here very quietly, but if they wanted to keep, continue to work on their group segment, they can go out into the hall and do it so they can talk. So I'd give them the option to, to leave. And it's really, you know, it's, um, you know, so, so pretty in informal in that way. Uh, so, and then, you know, we'd record our segment and then that group got to be like right up looking at the computer, talking, seeing the process. There were bystanders who were watching it on the screen and then there were people out in the hall kind of developing their projects. And we just kind of cycle through um, until, uh, and then, and then of course, like the whole music recording the intro was just chaos. Like students were clapping and singing and, and being, you know, knuckleheads, being, being 18 year olds. Uh, that's, that's great. Thank you. How long was this whole time period of your class? I took two days to do it. One day was just planning and uh, one day was planning. It was the whiteboard. I was writing down all the ideas and figuring out the organization. And that would be a Monday. And then I, I would tell them on Wednesday, you need to come to class uh, prepared, to uh, prepared to record your segment. So Wednesday, we take, they were only doing like 90 second segments. And so maybe take would take like maybe five minutes or so to record it on, get it where we wanted. Um, and then we'd have like probably six segments. So, you know, it maybe took like 30, 40 minutes. And then I posted it on our um, course management page. Uh, we use Moodle. And so all the students can listen to it later. And then I shared it with faculty. So your, your class is 45 minutes, is an hour and a half? It's uh, 50 minutes, sorry. About 50 minutes. I, I bet they were super proud. Were they super proud of it? Yeah, I mean, but they didn't really want to show it. Like, they were a little bit too cool to be proud. Some of them, some of them I think uh, I could tell that they, they, they really enjoyed the process. And those were the students who really did great on their individual podcasts. So, Jason, could you tell from that whether how many of your students had had experience making media before this class with you and how many of them were virgins? Right, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, and I kind of, I, I really was testing the temperature beforehand. And, you know, with the exception, it's, it's this weird thing, like when you get to a college, like a community college, a rural area, there's not a lot of technology. I think you can make these, these assumptions, like I was doing at the time. Um, oh, my students don't know how to use any of these tools. Uh, but then I started to realize that my students are already so adept at, at the interface, at finding where the button should be on kind of any program. And the, you know, the example I always use is, uh, you know, someone from my generation, uh, I need to be taught where there is a share button. I need to be shown, okay, here's a share button, here's how you share it. But my students, it's so ingrained in the way that they communicate that they already know there's going to be, whether it's Prezi, whether it's Flipgrid, whatever it is, there's going to be a share button. I just have to find it. Um, so they, they already know how these things work. They might just not know this specific program. And I mean, you know, they, these, these uh, Adobe Spark and Flipgrid, I mean, they are all very user friendly and, and they know how to Google if they run into problems. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so let me just, uh, I have some examples, but I see it's already 6.40. Um, maybe I'll, I'll play a one example of one of their podcasts that they created. Um, I used um, SoundCloud to update these, or to upload these. Uh, here's kind of a funny one. What's up? It's your boy, DT, coming at you live for this week's D.I.K. podcast. This week, we're featuring the lovely town of Ironwood, Michigan. The town of Ironwood is nestled at the base of the Porcupine Mountains, 18 miles south of the Lake Superior shore on the Michigan-Wisconsin border. Now, before we cut to our on-location reports, here's a message from our sponsor. Launchpad is a resource to help students and instructors achieve better results. It's a small investment on your part to get started. The rewards pay off for everyone. Thanks, Launchpad. Now we're going to take you to a local hotspot. What's up? We're here at the McDonald's parking lot. Sir. What? Can I get an interview? How long is it going to take? 
Only a couple minutes, sir. Um, I guess so. All right. What do you think of the area, and what do you like to do? Well, there really isn't much to do. As you can see, we are hanging out in the McDonald's parking lot. So what? Okay, so you can see, I don't know why he's doing a Sean Connery accent. We don't have a lot of uh, uh, Scottish population up here. We're all finished, but... Um, but I mean, you can see, like this, I, I we really spent a, uh, spent a good amount of time listening to these different podcasts and exploring how some podcasts uh, tell stories. Some are are like comedy shows. Some are news reports. And the students all got to pick their their format, their their style. And so some really embraced. There's there's a couple other where they're like travel logs, and some of them are 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 exploring mysteries in the area. And and so the the, the ones that that really did well. You know, they, they really uh, took ownership over it, which was fun. And these were, just to clarify, these were all collaborative projects. Students worked in groups of three or four. Um, I didn't require every student to have a speaking role because that's not every student's strength. Um, some students are the writers, some are the preparers, and, and, and students have to learn how to work in, the, uh, in teams and to find, identify their strengths and fit within a team. And so I really wanted to try to embrace that in, in, in the spirit of developing real world skills. And the final thing we did, uh, this was our final project, was um, students created a website. This was a really selfish project for me because uh, I moved up here in August. And I, so, so around the winter, uh, December, November or so of 2017, I experienced my first Western UP winter. Um, we get about 300 inches of snow a year up here. And just this January, uh, we had about a 10-day span of um, uh, where, where the temperature hovered right around negative 41 degrees. Uh, and this isn't wind chill. This was just what the air was outside. Wind chill was down into the negative 60s. Uh, and so with, I have family with four little kids. Uh, this is not an a easy way to live <laughs> when it's this cold. And I, we're, you know, we love the outdoors. So, um, so I... I, I turned this back to my students. What do you guys do in the winter here? Um, you know, so I had them create a winter survival guide. I posted the assignment and I'll let you guys kind of explore it on your own, but ultimately create a winter survival guide. And I gave them the freedom to define survival however they wanted to. Um, we certainly weren't just thinking only about, you know, like Bear grills sort of survival, but also we were thinking about um, survival from seasonal depression, uh, survival from uh, new families with young kids moving to the area. Well, how do you stop from getting so stir crazy? Um, how to stay active? How to you know stop you know how to how to keep from gaining weight in the winter and all these different ways that they could define survival, and uh, and then to, to put it in a website. And I gave students some very basic um, um, guidelines where, uh, you know, I, gave them, I told them, like, here's some websites I've used in the past to create websites, like um, Weebly, Wix, WordPress, Google Sites. Uh, these are all great ways, very in, um, intuitive places where you can create websites. And they were the ones. And then some, I gave them also some loose um, guidelines. Like they had to have three main kind of focused art, uh, articles and then a series of what I called sidebars, which would be something like, top five places to grab a burger in the area or best three things to do uh, for fun for under $10. And, and so um, here's a couple examples of, of what the students came up with that I thought uh, were pretty good. This is um, one that I, it looks like they used uh, Google Sites for this one. And so this is, uh, let me start with the homepage. Um, this is just a, a web page that students came up with for with different areas: the great outdoors, winter sports, city, city life, and winter warnings. And of course, they focused on things like all the skiing you can do up here. Uh, but some of the stuff that I thought was neat was um, it's kind of winter warnings. Um, uh, they gave links, uh, snow charts, but also links to emergency services, snow plowing, car repairs. Um, uh, a kit of what you always have to have in your um, car, snacks, cat litter, if you need to get traction, flashlight. Um, and let's see, uh, here's one a student used uh, Wix to create this website. Um, and they, they actually found that Wix was probably the, the easiest one for them to use. Um, they liked that one quite a bit. But and, you know, this one was a little bit more text heavy. But again, they focus on 
I don't see it in this one. It might have been one of the other samples. A lot of them did focus on um, issues with depression, and, and some of them had a real uh, focused target audience. Like, this is a survival guide for uh, teenage girls or a survival guide for, uh, uh, you know, a, a person with a young family or a survival guide for an athlete. You know? So they would have some kind of focused um, description for that. And then again, some of the skills that, that they really embrace and that we focus on doing something like this is, is it's thinking a lot about um, rhetoric, audience, purpose, and style. Who is the survival guide going out to? Um, visual design, how to collaborate between text and image, and then also back to writing and organization. And throughout this, it wasn't, you know, one thing I feel like I have to explain is that throughout this process of doing the Flipgrid videos, doing the podcast, doing the website. We were always writing as uh, as a way to develop ideas in between these assignments. We had uh, two um, kind of like formal academic essays where one was they had a defined culture and the other one was that personal narrative. Um, but then the final products were always moving beyond the essay because, like I said before, uh, a seven-page research essay is rarely ever the appropriate response to any real-world issue. And so they, you know, but maybe the appropriate response would be to share your ideas through a podcast, through a website, through, through some kind of digital um, media. And so the students uh, started to, by the end of the semester, really uh, and start to embrace that. Um, so now I, uh, I think that I'll just, uh, I'll stop here. I actually have about a 15 minute video that I put together, but it's kind of how we incorporated some of this in the next stage. Um, so maybe I could just summarize it really quickly. Uh, the next class after 101 is our research writing class. And so now when they're doing, each student is individually doing these in-depth research projects. Um, they, this was more of a traditional composition class, but uh, again, at the, the last about five to seven weeks of the semester, um, where normally I think a class would do presentations, um, I told students, okay, you know, you've been working on this research for 10 weeks. How do you get your ideas out there? What is, the, what is the appropriate response to share these ideas, to provoke some kind of change in the community? And I let them pick and design their own projects. And some students uh, working with issues of, of um, plastic waste uh, created a two-week course and wrote a syllabus and a whole project about teaching a course. Other students did podcasts, some did websites, some wrote um, children's books about uh, issues that they felt were most important to younger generations. Some students wrote uh, a whole series of like recipe cards that they could hang on groceries to create aware or uh, grocery stores to create awareness to healthy eating habits. And, and so they, they were able to kind of in a lot of different ways produce their own media content. Um, and so when I share this present, you can actually watch this video. And what it is, is a, um, it's, it's a group of like seven or eight students that I interviewed after the projects were done and they're explaining their, their kind of creation um, process. Of, of creating these projects. And so my final slide is just a list of some of the, the tools that I used and, and that my students use in these classes. And, and if I can just emphasize anything, uh, I think that, that it's, it's, it's hard to jump into uh, using digital media in the classroom because I think that as an instructor, oftentimes we, at least I, feel a lot of insecurity. What if a student has a question about audacity that I can't answer? Um, well, then it just gives you an opportunity to explore that. I mean, you're, we're smart people, you know, we can, we can figure this out with our students. And a lot of times our students figure it out for us and it creates kind of, it tears down some walls between us and the students. Um, so for me, the biggest transition was making that decision um, to be, you know, uh, to, to, to be, try to be a really good teacher and not worry so much about uh, being perfect at these tools. I mean, I was just going to throw them out there and, and work on it together with my students in kind of the collaborative spirit. So, yeah, that's, uh, you guys have any, any questions about this project? Okay, so I have a question. That, that was fascinating. So how have, how have you seen the development of your own digital competencies over the last year? You know, it's uh, you about your own growth. Yeah. Over the last year in teaching this way. Um, you know, it's been really an awesome process for me because my head is in digital media in a very in a in a really theoretical way. And before um, the the summer institute, I was uh, reading a lot of uh, uh, kind of theory and philosophy about 
uh, how people connect in the digital age. And, and I had very little practical skill in terms of, of creating digital media, but I was trying to understand it. Like, how does it shape us as humans? How does the language we use to describe connection um, um, affect our actual connections with people and, and, or get in the way of those connections? And so I was, I've always kind of approached that, I guess you'd say kind of this abstract level and starting to implement these uh, tools into my classroom allowed me to get really hands-on uh, uh, experience with it. And, to, and, and I found a lot of opportunities where I've talked with the faculty at my college that, that uh, have a, an, an issue with something and I'll say, you know what, Here, here's a tool you can use. And then a little bit later, uh, a month down the road, that faculty member will come back to me and say, hey, you know that, you know, like Adobe Spark is an example. Hey, you know how you were using Adobe Spark for this reason? I'm actually using it in this way now. And so then I'm kind of learning from them. And I'm like, oh, well, what if, and so it's like, it's just this kind of collaborative learning process. And realistically, we have 32 faculty at our, at our college uh, right now. And, um, and some just embrace it and run with it. And, and the majority don't. Um, but there are a good amount of, of faculty that, that are really, they really, really like diving in. And, and I think that's, you know, really, it's, it's kind of cool. Like we have, I don't know, probably like six or seven faculty members who are teaching five, six classes a piece, all using Flipgrid and Adobe Spark. And, and they weren't doing that before the digital literacy conference. I mean, wow. Really kind of, <laughs> and their students are, are learning in new kind of ways. Uh, so it's pretty exciting. Um, I, I want to ask about the arc of the, the student's experience. So you, you shared and you, you looked at like the process. Can you, I don't know if it's like do a persona of the, the, the student or something, but can you explain to us the process that the student went through like as the overarching of the class going in, including the second class of the research. So they did those, I think, three iteration in your first class, and then they did the research project in the second class. So how did you see the, like, the student skills evolve? Like, what, what, was, what did you witness there? Um, well, I guess the first thing that comes to mind is in the first class, I was very directive about the tools we're going to use. Um, we're gonna use Flipgrid for this. We're gonna do a podcast, we're gonna do a website. And, and I think that I gave them a lot of freedom within those categories uh, or with those genres. But um, in the research writing class, I didn't tell them how to respond to projects, how to, how to respond. And so that was the biggest, uh, the biggest change is that most of the students who were in my research class were in my earlier classes. And once they kind of started to see in that first class how these projects could be used and could reach a larger audience, uh, and then they had exposure to a couple different uh, tools, then later on, when they did their own research projects, um, they were able to start to evaluate uh, and analyze these tools in, in order to figure out what is, their, what is the best response for their specific project. And, and so there was such a variety. So I think it shows a kind of a level of, of, of maturity in digital media for them to be able to um, make those decisions. Uh, you know, so so that, was, that, was, that was one way. Um, the other way is, you know, there's this kind of, uh, I don't I mean, uh, it, uh, you know, I'll just say, I think there's, a, when I first introduced it, there's this kind of apathy um, about it. Like, oh, this is just one thing that I got to learn. And I hate to describe these students like this because they're really, uh, they're really incredible students. Um, but I think that this is a pretty typical response for an 18 year old who has to learn a whole new tool and have like kind of an, uh, an old guy teach it to them, you know? Um, so they, they were uh, a little bit resistant at first, um, but once they started to see finished product, final products and started to explore the different possibilities of these tools and then the creative juices started flowing and started asking questions like, what if I did this? And oh, I could do this. And, 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 and they really kind of let loose and just embraced this kind of creative process of, of digital production. Um, you know, in, in these modes. So, you know, is it really an attitude shift and also a development of some type of expertise in being able to fit these tools within a rhetorical triangle, I think, a rhetorical situation? That was a really great description of the, Yanti, that was a really great question to inquire about the sort of shift in kids thinking over time. I have also found that 
you, uh, you are totally right, Jason, about that initial response. Is like, oh, geez, another <laughs> thing. Right. That sense of like, you know, who is this crazy person and why are they making me do this crazy thing? And then the, the shift as they start to develop a feeling of ownership and the, like you said, and their creative uh, impulse overrides yeah. the, oh, oh, this is schoolwork phenomenon. So that was a great description of that process. Thanks. Yeah, and a really good question. Um, and I found students uh, could started to draw connections between the skills that they already possessed and and find it within an academic setting. For an example, I have a, a guy. Uh, he's just a really funny uh, guy in my class who creates memes. He makes YouTube videos. He's got all these followers, and to them, to, for him, this is just his way of connecting, being the funny guy, connecting with his friends. And, and then there was like this moment in the semester where it clicked for him that I was actually asking him to do this in an academic setting. And, and I wasn't asking him to be serious, I was just asking him to explore a topic. So he did his research project on media literacy and, and vetting our sources and, and double checking and, and uh, lateral reading and all these things. And so he created this really funny kind of spoof YouTube video uh, where he played all these different characters. They were all having conversations with each other about why it's important to double check your sources. And so he realized he could still be that kind of funny meme creator and explore an important issue with it. And, um, you know, you find with a few students that where, where that clicks, like their interests can also be their academic work. And I, this cycles all the way back to that idea of intellectual curiosity that I, I mentioned at the beginning. If a student can, can just find this curiosity, can start to be curious, curious about something, and explore it, then their work just takes life. Uh, it takes on a new life. So I have a um, challenging, tough question. Um, you, so you describe all this process, and I can totally see it in my students. You know, Columbia College, the artsy kind of students coming to like the third largest city in the U.S. Um, and besides the context of what they were talking about, which was their own like rural setting, do you like experience or do you have anything to think that the rural community college is providing a different experience than what you experience at URI, which might people consider Kingston rural? I don't know how much comparing to where you're now, you know. Um, so, I'm interested if you think that the rural setting is more as providing the context, or does it have more than that as part of your teaching and part of the experience of the students? Yeah, that is a good question. Uh, you know, I think that in terms, of the, the rural setting was important to me because it was, the rural setting was a light bulb for me. I was, I was, I was trying to think, like, what can I do to get these students to, to start to care about their work? And so the, um, when I thought about exploring culture, that was a way for me to make a connection with them because I knew that they were invested in their culture. Um, but I don't think that it has, I mean, it certainly doesn't have to be a rural setting for them to explore these things. And, and I would love the opportunity to do a project like this in a setting like Chicago or in New York, where instead of um, thinking about like rural culture, they can create um, um, representations of the different neighborhoods. And I, I've, I've, I've spent a lot of time in Chicago and, and in New York City and, and know that every kind of like neighborhood has a different kind of vibe or feeling or, 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 or a culture. And, and so it'd be really cool to explore the different cultures in, in, a, very, in a very urban setting. Um, so I don't think that um, this was, I, I posed the, the question of, you know, how to do this in a rural college uh, because, because this was a way for me to break through to these students, but it is in no way limiting um, to like only a rural college, if that, if that makes sense. So I think there's, you know, just a, a, really a lot of ways to explore different cultures in any setting. And on that positive note, we come to like uh, the end of our hour. Um, I don't know if uh, Renee, Antonio, you have anything to add or question or? We just want to give you a big round of applause. That was really very thought provoking, uh, great examples, super inspiring. Uh, man, your, your colleagues are lucky to have you, Jason, lucky to have you.
Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to share some of this work. Thank you so much. So that, that was a great closure for our academic year and our series of webinars to inspire, you know, how you connect with your students when you come to like a new place, no matter if it's rural, urban, wherever, and really using digital tools to, to inspire collaboration and inquiry. And so if you're watching this recorded video, you probably want to come to the Summer Institute in Digital Literacy, which this summer is July 14th through 19th in Providence, www.digiuri.com. That's the commercial. Sorry, Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, was about, and we're back from the commercial break. <laughs> Again, thank you so much. All right. Good night.